Please join me in welcoming Dr. Irene Chu, recipient of the 2015 Lemuel J. Bowie Young Investigator Award, as she speaks on neonatal drug testing. Thank you very much for this very nice introduction and for you guys to come up here um, late night uh, listening to my talk. Um, I, as uh, introduction mentioned, I work at the United States Drug Testing Laboratories at the uh, Assistant Laboratory Director. Majority of our lab testing is dealing with neonatal drug testing and we saw a lot of interesting results. We received lots of samples giving us some significant um, uh, indications of um, what's going on in the neonatal um, toxicology and I would like to share those results with you tonight. And my financial disclosure is that I'm an employee of the USDTL and I also come here all carpooling with the president and executive <laughs> president. <laughs> so um, the objectives tonight, I will start with the background of uh, federal state child fear policies and how this affects the neonatal drug testing. This certainty can make the neonatal drug testing far more complex just than just looking for drugs in babies. And that leads to um, talk about how to test uh, such as um, subjects uh, with the means of forensic toxicologies, what specimen um, types we can choose for, some concerns we need to consider, and I'd like to present to you this survey of the drug testing results in our lab during a six month period of time, July to December 2014. So maternal drug use certainly gives lots of negative uh, impacts on the child outcome. And in fact, it is surrounded by uh, several other factors in terms of social, emotional, psychological, economical um, things going on of the maternal drug use that gives lots of um, impacts to the uh, child care. Those factors happen during the prenatal phase and also during the postnatal phase when we're talking about providing the caregiving environment. And any point of time providing the intervention can help protecting and changing the lives of the babies, the mothers, and of course the families. Now policy makers uh, are very good at making uh, legal actions, making such uh, interventions, and um, 80s is, um, is a time when the headlines um, talking about crack babies that draw public uh, in attentions about prenatal drug uh, exposure. <coughs> so of course a lot of uh, legal proposals were given, good or bad, um, those were approved or opposed. Um, wide range of legal actions include increased services for the pregnant women, the affected children or the, to the other side of the spectrum criminalizing the uh, drug using women. In 2003, the federal law um, took place, Keeping Children and Families Safe Act. Um, under this new law, the new eligibility requirements uh, were added um, for people getting access to the child welfare funding under the Child Abuse Prevention and Pre uh, Treatment Act. Excuse me. So this new eligibility is that the state needs to have the policies in place that requires the health care providers to notify CPS, Child Protective Services, when they recognize a newborn showing some symptoms um, indicative of exposed to illegal substances during um, pregnancy. And um, the other entity would be uh, Child Protective Services, CPS, what they do is that when they uh, receive this notification, they develop, they develop a plan of safe care for such an infant. So as you notice, there are two uh, 
independent entities involved in there. Uh, the states need to have the law in place in order to implement such a notification mechanism. But not all the states do that. Only some states um, have uh, physicians being mandatory to notify CPS. That's number one. And another uh, difference between the state policies I want to highlight is that the prenatal drug exposure is included to the definition of child abuse and neglect. And here is to demonstrate which states have this uh, statutes of uh, reporting. As of this month, 15 states, in, uh, including Illinois states, require reporting when the um, pregnancy drug abuse is suspected. Four states are required to uh, do testing, and of those, uh, three states um, are required to do both testing and reporting, and Kentucky only requires the testing. However, the reporting may um, be warranting some uh, drug testing to perform in order to make such a reporting decision. And what that may lead to is that in some states, um, they would consider the pregnancy drug abuse um, to be grounds for civil commitment in three states, child abuse in 18 states, and one state in Tennessee of uh, criminal acts. All those are very harsh punishment for the mothers, and in fact that kind of um, defeat the purpose of directing the moms for the treatment. And um, because of this law being in place, they're afraid to tell so in order to seek treatments. <coughs> and on the bright side of the legal system is that there are uh, treatments in place um, uh, by the state law. 19 states, including Illinois, have uh, targeted program created for such a situation. Pregnant women given priority access in um, 11 states and other four states having pregnant mom protected from this discrimination. So all this uh, legal background um, becomes, um, makes the drug testing um, important in the sense that this may be a game changer for the authorities make the decision what's a uh, best arrangement in place in each state for the mothers and the children. And that's what made the forensic drug testing so important because the drug um, testing results uh, should be ensured uh, accurate and valid so that it can be provided as a um, defensible evidence. So that leads to the next topic about how to deal with the neonatal drug testing cases. And let's start with the concept of <coughs> forensic toxicology. There are four elements of this, um, starting with the, the establishing a chain of custody. Uh, we need the initial testing, and the positive results need to be confirmed with the second aliquot. And finally, the data um, need to be carefully certified. Um, starting from the chain of custody, every step of the way of the sample whereabouts is documented, starting from the collection all the way to the sample disposal. And keep in mind, at the uh, receipt of the samples, the sample cup need to have the um, tape to show um, that it's not tempered, but if it's broken, then the chain of custody is broken, therefore the samples cannot be further um, pushed through the rest of the procedures. And initial testing is performed usually by immunoassays, and if immunoassays are not available, instrumental screening um, uh, can be used as well. Uh, the results are in either presence or absence of the results, and uh, if the results is absent, it's released, the place is closed. Close. But the, for the presence, cases, it needs to be referred for the uh, second aliquot for confirmatory testing. The key point here is that um, the methodology needs to be, or ideally, be the different scientific principle from the initial testing. Usually it involves uh, 
um, combination of chromatography, chromatography separation and mass spectrometry detection. And in the test results, it is reported at the drug identity and the quantity slash uh, concentration. The data certification is also very careful. Um, certain quality control criteria must be met and the reviewing process involves uh, usually more than one data reviewer. And the confirmation results are reviewed with the initial testing results. So this is a general idea of forensic toxicology being the defensible um, results being released. So um, what is the indication for the babies being drug tested? Um, many hospitals have their own guidelines. Uh, in general, they look at two um, main parts, the mother's risk factors and the baby's clinical symptoms. They look for the mom, see if they have a history of drug abuse, uh, even in the past pregnancies. Do they miss a lot of the preclinical visits? Do they have some um, bloodborne infectious diseases? And um, do they, uh, was it a premature labor? And uh, for the newborn, they look for the neurologic complication, um, some symptoms of uh, drug withdrawal, and uh, if the babies are smaller, smaller than the regular gestation, um, in the gestation age. And there are several specimen types um, available for um, performing the neonatal drug testing. Over here I put uh, urine, hair, meconium, and umbilical cord. And I will put several aspects to make comparison between these specimen types. For the detection window, um, apparently urine um, get can get the drug positive with a um, very short amount of time window, uh, only past few days of um, from birth when the mom took the drug. For hair and meconium, the detection window can uh, drop further back. Um, the catch over here for the reservoir type of specimens um, is very hard to determine um, or correlate the concentration, uh, concentration of the drugs um, with uh, how many times the mom use, uh, how much the dose the moms use the drugs, and how often, when was the last time the um, mom was using it. Um, so at this point, it's very difficult to determine um, by the drug testing, see if the mom actually uh, really have the drug abuse problem or just uh, do it one time by experimentally. In any case, um, those are kind of the behaviors in some uh, people's mind. Those are um, not very careful and maybe a um, suspicion in uh, their decision making for um, child's well-being. Um, so for hair, generally we say it's, uh, the detection window is three months. It's under the assumption that the hair grows a half inch uh, for every one month. Um, for the baby's hair in utero, it's very hard to say in that sense, but this is what we generally look at. Meconium um, in publication, um, it is said to start forming um, since the second trimester. And so, for a lot of cases, neonates may be a uh, preterm and may be less than three months, more than three months, depending on um, when the child is born. But that's when the uh, detection window starts um, counting, uh, second trimester. Um, there's little literature how uh, demonstrates how the drug is deposited on the umbilical cord. But in general, um, some studies say that um, the two matrix types have a similar um, drug um, positivity rate, and therefore it is assumed that it has the same detection window as meconium. So that's detection window. Next is the sample collection um, point of view. 
there are four aspects that we need to consider for each of the um, specimen type to collect. Um, urine for um, babies it may be very difficult to collect and may be uh, insufficient. For some baby, they may have a lot of hair, but some uh, do not have that much. And meconium, on the other hand, compared to the first uh, two matrix types, um, they're uh, much more sufficient. However, it's not very much available. Sometimes it is not sufficient um, for some uh, clinical conditions for the babies. In that sense, umbilical cord is um, far more um, advantageous compared to um, meconium in terms of the quantity of the sample and the availability of the sample. Um, as of the timing of the sample collection, um, because of the um, uh, detection window for urine, it is quite uh, time sensitive. Um, for meconium, even though it's a oh, reservoir matrix type, um, the reason it is kind of uh, time sensitive is because the baby um, have its own stool develop um, after two days instead of the meconium simply come from uh, <coughs> during, um, that's formed during the pregnancy. That means the drug may be diluted out. Um, for hair, though, it is not as time sensitive in terms of uh, drug detection. However, if we wait for too long, the environmental exposure may come to the complication. So that uh, needs to be kept in mind. For umbilical cord, it's uh, readily available at birth. So you just, uh, it, uh, we don't need to wait for that much um, um, and then just collect it. Uh, last but not least is the chain of custody integrity. All of them are relatively speaking in, can be intact compared to meconium because meconium may involve several collections to get uh, enough samples to the sample cup. And I once heard a story saying that there is this um, meconium sample being um, tested um, positive for marijuana it was a term, determined to be a false positive case. Um, and it turns out that it was coming from the wrong baby sample to the um, sample collection. So that's what it means the um, chain of custody integrity may be broken in that sense. In terms of test methods, um, we need to keep in mind that a lot of uh, urine drug testing immunoassays are set for the workplace drug test cutoff, which, which may be too high for the baby testing. For hair, um, although it's useful, um, usually it involves a lot of laborious uh, laboratory processes and we need uh, much higher sensitivity technique for performing the drug. The, Drug concentrations are in picogram per milligram type of concentration. For meconium, the drug concentration can be collected uh, quite well, um, so sensitivity may not be the concern. However, some um, special metabolite that we don't normally see from the adults need to be added to it, otherwise uh, false negative results may appear. Uh, for example, methylhydroxybenzylagonine needs to be included for the cocaine confirmation. Uh, for umbilical cord, one challenging technique is to homogenize the tissue. It's not always easy, and um, the drug concentration um, is much less compared to meconium, so I would demonstrate that furthermore when I get to uh, each drug uh, classes that I present. So here we uh, collected a lot of data um, during this six month period of time. Note that the results that I'm going to present is um, coming from the babies at risk. It is not by performing uh, to survey the national uh, drug prevalence of um, the 
babies exposed to drug in utero. Um, the purpose of the survey is to have a bigger picture, um, finding out what type of drug that is high prevalence, um, what do the concentrations look like, and um, some analytical concerns can give us some quality improvement um, plan. So here I start off um, by addressing what kind of drug panel the laboratory performs when they when we receive the test samples. Over here, I only um, survey the meconium and umbilical cord samples. Note that this survey um, is not a matched sample, um, meaning that it's not the meconium and umbilical cord or U cord samples coming from the same baby, but rather it's. Um, uh, when the survey was done, the IDs are um, marked. We simply just pick up whatever sample sent to us, get tested, and survey what the test results are. We received about 8,000 um, meconium samples and almost 17,000 umbilical cord samples. So we have a big pool of data. Hopefully the um, results I'm going to present to you show some significance to it. Um, these are the distribution of the um, newborn samples um, ordered for the drug testing. Not all of them are um, done by five panel or uh, 13 panel. Five panel includes uh, amphetamines, marijuana or cannabinoids, cocaine, opiates, and PCP only. For the seven panel, we added methadone and barbiturates. Nine panel, there is uh, benzodiazepines and propoxyphene. Uh, Twelve panels has um, oxycodone, meperidine, and tramadol. Last but not least, uh, buprenorphine is added to the 13 panel. And when I will present you the um, positivity rate of each drug, um, the way the calculation is done is that the uh, positive results is normalized by um, the, what the samples are actually ordered for. So um, when I calculate the amphetamines positivity rate, um, because all of the drug panels have amphetamines, I simply um, take the positive um, amount of samples divided by the total amount of um, samples we received. Whereas, for example, um, benzodiazepines, I take the positive amount of samples divided by uh, the number that's beyond nine panel only, and so on. So buprenorphine only takes um, 2,000 meconium samples, 8,000 uh, umbilical cord samples as a denominator. Here is just briefly go through the test methodologies for the two different specimen types. Uh, in meconium, we need to do some solid phase uh, extraction treatment before the cedia and emit um, homogeneous immuno assays. And once the drugs are screened positive, those are referred to the confirmation test. We don't further investigate the um, uh, negative samples uh, for this study. And so most of the drug types are confirmed by GCMS, only buprenorphine is confirmed by LCMSMS. For umbilical cord, on the other hand, it's simply being grinded up, um, dried down, reconstituted to be tested by ELISA. And um, majority of the drug classes um, in comparison with meconium are done by LCMSMS. Only THC, PCP, and uh, meperidine are done by GCMS. So here are the positivity rates of each drug class. And those positivity rate is ranked, shown here, uh, that is seen in umbilical cord. THC is the highest prevalent drug type we see from those specimens. Um, on, that is on the right hand side and on the left hand side from meconium I kind of match uh, their positivity rate com to be compared with umbilical cord and if you glance through them um, their ranking is not so much far off um, there is some um, um, 
some different positivity rate that uh, swap the uh, <coughs> ranking uh, for oxycodone and benzodiazepines. Those are mostly because of the um, different methodologies, the different cutoff we have available for the two matrix types, and the um, analytes we include for the confirmation. <coughs> So here is, um, just to demonstrate what I just said here, um, in the several slides when I will um, look close up to each drug type, I, I'll put up both meconium and umbilical cord um, for the, um, each drug class. This number here means what uh, drug panel it is included. Um, the confirmation methodology for each side and the lower limit of quantitation in the confirmation. And as you can see, for uh, BZP and meconium, we only confirm for exazepam, accounting for 0.1% of the positivity rate. And by the way, I put in the um, positivity rate between meconium versus uh, umbilical cord at the bottom, um, just to uh, refresh your memory from the uh, summary slide. And the little numbers here demonstrate how this positivity rate is calculated. Um, umbilical cord, on the other hand, if you look at only the exazepam, the positivity rate is actually very similar as that in meconium. So this 3% accounted for all the other additional um, analytes we added to the umbilical cord. So looking into the um, drug ranking, you can see THC and OPS, those are the five panels being the highest um, drug club, uh, highest prevalence of drug classes. But they are followed by these drug classes that come from the more extensive drug panel. So does that mean if the uh, samples not being uh, tested with the extended panels, uh, the positive results would be missed out. So here I pick up the most extended drug panel for the um, specimens we tested. Um, there were 2,000 meconium samples tested for 13 panel. Um, almost 40% of them is positive for at least one of the 13 drug classes. In that, um, majority of them are positive for um, one of the five, at least one of the five panel drug classes that are amphetamines, cocaine, um, marijuana, opiates, and PCP. In addition, 300 of the meconium samples are positive for the more extended drugs. And um, this overlap area, uh, 97 samples represent that it pos it's positive for one or more of the five panel and one or more of the extended drug classes. And so the non-overlap here, 200 uh, meconium samples are the ones that do not have those five panel drugs. So if those samples were tested by only five panel, 27% would have been missed um, as a positive result. And the same analysis is done for the umbilical cord. Uh, 8,000 samples tested for 13 panels, 45% positive rate. Um, almost 40% of those positive samples may have been missed if the uh, five panel drug testing was ordered. And um, that certainly is concerning us. So the other way to look at our um, samples is that um, if those uh, samples uh, order for the limited drug panel being missed out for the extended drugs. Um, we only look into one week worth of umbilical cord data one week is um, almost about 1,000 um, umbilical cord we receive in our lab. 
in that week, um, those are the number of samples ordered for the five panel. And in our internal study, we um, analyze those samples as if they were ordered for 13 panel or the most extensive um, drug testing panel. So for five panel and all the way to nine panel, those samples um, were missed by seven to 10 percent for those drug classes. Those are from the 12, 9, and 7 panels. Um, at least the 5 panel would be missing out. And so this percentage doesn't seem to be um, a lot compared to what we just see from the 13 panel analysis that we look at. Um, that's probably because the physicians um, for um, ordering those 13 panel drugs, either they know what they're looking for, or um, um, the extended drugs simply are not um, of the interest for the physicians when they look for the when they order the limited drug panel. In any case, those cases uh, would have been missed out the opportunity for further confirmation in those drug classes, and that's certainly concerning. For now coming back to this ranking, we will look into the high prevalence drug class in the um, minifying glass. So first off is a THC. It's, uh, um, it's certainly a concern because more and more states are legalizing the recreational marijuana use. A couple of weeks ago, um, Joe Jones um, presented this data at College and Problems of Drug Dependence, looking at um, THC meconium sample out of the Colorado, um, see if the um, law changes in terms of uh, relaxing the marijuana regulation can make the difference for our drug testing. Unfortunately, um, from that state, we don't get that many umbilical cords, so only, I only present um, Joe's analysis in meconium sample. So back in 2012, this is the year when the initiative was passed um, for relaxing the marijuana relaxation. 10% is the positivity rate. Uh, 2014 is when the law became effective and here we see some increase of the uh, positivity rate. Not so much. However, if we're looking at the concentration um, uh, comparing the two years, um, we certainly see a um, big increase of THC in meconium. And later I will present a lot of this kind of whisker uh, box plot. Um, what it shows you is um, the general distribution of drug concentration for all the um, samples we tested. That means the border of the whiskers is pretty much the lowest and the highest uh, concentration we see in our lab uh, ruling out the outliers. The middle line in this box represents the, um, the median. That means 50% of the population has concentration below here. The other half is above there. And the lower limit of the box, so this line represents the median concentration of this half of the population. And the other side of the box is a median of the second half of the population. So that, that certainly shows you a much um, more spread out of the concentration seen in 2014 from Colorado um, compared to year 2012. But this effect is not as prominent from the other side of the country. Um, coming back to that six month period of time of survey, um, this is the uh, concentration of carboxy THC um, distribution in meconium sample. And on the right hand side is the, uh, what is seen in umbilical cord. 
So you can see in uh, meconium samples, the THC concentration is much higher than in umbilical cord. Uh, with that, we needed to use different derivatization um, methods in order to um, make the sensitivity much better in order to have the positivity rate between the two matrix types to be equivalent. So that's THC. The next prevalent drugs are the opiates and several opioids and sedative um, benzodiazepines. It is a big concern because maternal opiates use um, increased drastically since 2000 to 2009, and this uh, y-axis indicate is the incidence per 1,000 births in the U.S. What does it mean to the babies? Uh, we found, or these two publications found, um, neonatal abstinence syndromes babies have increased throughout the years, and um, those increases are consistent. So what exactly is NAS? It is strongly associated with premature birth, low birth weights. Um, those babies have broad spectrums of symptoms we're looking at. Um, there is some scoring system for the nurses to, um, to see how serious uh, those symptoms are. Um, in general, they have high-pitched cry, tremors, stiff limbs, GI problems, feeding tolerance and so on. Um, the timing of the onset um, may be drug dependent. Although it is called neonatal um, abstinence syndrome, um, indicating the OPS use, that doesn't mean that those symptoms come from only um, the opioids in utero exposure. So for alcohol, in utero exposure, the onset of the abstinence syndrome comes uh, the soonest, followed by heroin exposure within 24 hours, and other opioids may have uh, some delay of onset, but it's typically within one to seven days. Um, other drugs may show some similar symptoms. Uh, for the treatments, the nurses may give the baby some morphine to calm them down uh, from those symptoms. Phenobarbital may be um, the second choice when polysubstance exposure is seen. Uh, for the non-pharmacological treatments, um, they breastfeed or um, make sure the environment is, um, is dark, it's quiet for the babies from um, <coughs> making them shaking all the time. This is um, particularly serious because total hospital charges um, increased uh, from 2009 to 2012 uh, from seven million dollars to one and a half billion dollars and that certainly gives us a lot of um, economy burden to um, address this issue. So what do we see in the country? A lot of the incidents um, take place over here followed by the New England Illinois State is here. The incident is about seven per 1,000 hospital births. So in our lab, um, those are the positivity rate we see for meconium samples versus umbilical cord. 9% uh, versus 12%. Um, here we uh, confirmed uh, four analysts for the OPH drug test. Um, out of 700 positive um, uh, samples for meconium, majority of them are positive for codeine and or morphine. And some other samples may be um, uh, only hydrocodone and hydromorphone present with a little bit of overlap of um, these two types of drugs. In umbilical cord, um, as you can see, the codeine and morphine positive rate is uh, essentially the same as that seen in the meconium. However, if we're looking at the hydrocodone hydromorphone, the majority of the um, positivity rate comes from the hydrocodone hydromorphone only babies.
So that uh, also explains why we see a uh, difference uh, positively rate between the two matrix types. This is to present the concentration <coughs> we see in uh, meconium uh, and umbilical cord. Morphine is much greater than the other uh, three analytes. Uh, if we want to have the close-up look, this is how they distribute it. Uh, versus in umbilical cord, the morphine concentration is not as drastically much higher than the others. And in fact, in 2012, I believe the USDTO uh, used to have the cutoff at uh, 1 nanogram per gram. And now we are able to reach the lower limit of detection much lower than that. And so this dashed line represents that if we remain having the same cutoff in the past, a lot of those babies oh, would have been missed out. Half of the hydromorphone positive will be missed. Uh, a quarter of the coding babies will be missed. A quarter of the hydrocodon babies will be missed. On top of that, in the LCMSMS, we included um, six monoacetylmorphine and mechanin to the assay to uh, specify that morphine and coding positive cases come from heroin exposure. So here I demonstrate more in detail how six, um, six man and how significant it is adding the mechanism to the overall opiate confirmation. So here is a metabolism of, of heroin. It metabolizes into six monoacetylmorphine or six man. It's quickly turned into morphine. And because the half-life is so short, the absence of six man does not justify the abstinence of uh, heroin use when we see the positive morphine results. On the other hand, morphine can come from by itself or um, metabolize from um, another pres prescription <coughs> opiates or codeine. So just by the morphine uh, results itself, it cannot uh, be used to dis distinguish the use of prescription opiates from heroin. So what do we do? There is another group looking into the contaminant of heroin. It's called noscapin. It can be metabolized into mechanin. And so this group looked into 300 morphine positive urine samples from the substance misuse services. So those urines may um, come from the heroin users. Only a little bit more than half of them have six men being tested versus um, mechanin is virtually uh, present uh, in all of those urine samples. So um, the lab thought that in including this mechanin into the um, opiate drug testing would give us more uh, heroin babies. So um, in this publication that just came out this year, um, they made the survey for a year. Um, in that year, there were about 1,800 uh, morphine-positive cases. Out of those, about 5% of them have 6 men with and without mechanin. However, there were 11 more cases that had only mechanin in it. And in uh, late 2014, I did the same survey um, that was done a year ago. This year, it turns out um, a much more percentage of the morphine positive cases had six men being detected. Fifteen more um, had mechanin only. So in this results, we may say that, well, the um, the increase isn't that much drastic as the other urine um, studies that we looked at in the past. However, those subjects we're talking about are babies. And um, those 11 plus 15 um, babies and the families represent that they are given more opportunities for the treatments. And for us, that is a significant increase. 
Um, in this six months of survey, we also looked at um, six man and mechanin concentration. This is how it's distributed. Um, if they were done in the past with the older cutoff, um, more than half of the babies would be messed up for um, heroin positive results. And as you can see, those um, concentrations are present at very low. So um, analytical concern um, needs to be addressed when we perform this type of testing. The next um, highest prevalent opioid is buprenorphine. Uh, this is the positive rate uh, seen in meconium, uh, 7%. Um, virtually all of, most of them have both the parent drug and the metabolite. But when we're looking at um, umbilical cord samples, a lot of the um, increased positive rate in umbilical cord compared to meconium come from the norbuprenorphine only case. Uh, as you can see, it may come from the lower detection limit we could reach compared to the buprenorphine, uh, compared to meconium method. Here again is a concentration distribution um, in meconium is much higher than in um, umbilical cord. Next high is this oxycodone, oxymorphone. It's in the 12th panel. 2% um, of the uh, meconium sample is positive for that. Uh, there was no oxymorphone being tested in oxymorphone. Uh, in meconium samples. But if we're looking at uh, umbilical cord samples, this increased positivity rate actually comes from the oxycodone only cases. Um, so again, sensitivity um, gives um, us much improved um, uh, detection sensitivity. Uh, this is the concentration distribution. Um, if you look closely here, the minimum um, concentration here is actually greater than what we could detect. Um, so the, sensi the test sensitivity in this sense might not be the only explanation to increase the positivity rate we see in umbilical cord. It might uh, also come from the missing oxycodone that we do not perform and it may um, come up as a different concentration distribution than we see in umbilical cord. In methadone, um, the positivity rate is essentially the same. All of them, or most of them, have both a parent uh, drug and a metabolite. But what's interesting is that the parent drug and the metabolite concentrations or relative concentrations is very different in two matrix type. In meconium, the metabolite, the metabolite is prevalent or prominent, um, uh, in other words. But in umbilical cord, it's the parent drug that shows a higher concentration than its metabolite. So I thought it's pretty interesting to look at. So those are the um, highest prevalent drug tests that um, may um, concern the NAS studies or NAS um, babies. Um, overall, meconium samples um, are positive for at least one of the four drug classes by about 13% versus in the biblical cord is 20%. What's even more concerning is that out of those positive results, um, there are some other amphetamine, cocaine, or marijuana present in those samples. That accounts for 20%. And this is of, of particularly concerning because those drugs are stimulants. They may mock the um, NAS symptoms that um, the nurses might not be able to spend enough time with the babies for the onset to happen. And um, those are um, very concerning for us. So I will close the uh, results by summarizing um, what I've talked about tonight. Um, forensic toxicology would be the proper approach to neonatal drug testing in our experience. 
meconium and umbilical, umbilical cord provide similar positivity rates in the prevalence um, of the drug type. The prevalence of the drug type we see in our lab is um, THC being the highest, followed by opiates and the opioids and sedatives that are in the um, more extensive drug panel to be ordered, followed by amphetamine and cocaine. Uh, Note that 20% uh, uh, of those babies are also positive for those illicit drugs. Umbilical cord tissue collects drugs and metabolizes at much lower concentrations than meconium and uh, the relative concentrations between the parent and the metabolites may be different between the matrix types. So with that, I close tonight's talk by thank you um, to AACC Chicago section by recognizing me, especially as the award is named after um, um, clinical chemists with such a passion in this field. And I certainly want to um, uh, live this legacy by following this AACC mission, Better Health Through Laboratory Medicine. So thank you again.